Global economic conflict has put crypto in the spotlight. Russian assets worth billions of dollars were frozen in response to Moscow's military operation in Ukraine. Some say cryptocurrency could be used as a backdoor to evade those restrictions. Anybody can create a wallet is the argument that often goes and, and then, then they can shift their, their funds between their wallets. How effective is crypto for evading financial sanctions? And what are the blockchain intelligence tools that could prevent that? We talked about it with Carolyn Malcolm, head of policy at crypto intelligence firm Chainalysis. Welcome to another exclusive Cointelegraph interview. So first of all, I wanted to ask you whether you noticed uh, some uh, increase or some change in crypto activity in Ukraine or Russia since the military conflict started? Yeah, so look, this is obviously an, an issue that we've looked at very closely since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and looking to see any changes really across the ecosystem. And I think the first thing that we need to remember is that we're talking about two economies which were sort of extremely crypto literate. So uh, in terms of levels of adoption, sort of grassroots adoption of crypto, we ranked uh, Ukraine fourth in the world and Russia 18th in the world. So we're already talking about economies where there's a significant level of, of, of crypto use and, 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 and transaction volume, uh, even before, before current uh, events. However, what we are seeing, which is unusual, is on specific trading pairs and, and, and thinking there in particular about sort of ruble to um, Bitcoin or Havinia, local Ukrainian currency to Bitcoin, we are seeing those sort of trading pairs be particularly active. And I think particularly in the case of the ruble, reaching really all time highs versus uh, in Ukraine, I think certainly very high levels, but certainly not all time highs, but certainly the highest we've seen in, in, in four or five months. Mm. And so how do you interpret that data? Do you, uh, do you think uh, Russians and Ukrainians are uh, buying more crypto, but and so for, for what purposes? Yeah, look, it's, it's obviously difficult to, to know what's, you know, what's the rationale behind um, behind those those changes that we're seeing. I mean, there's certainly been different different theories in, in terms of, you know, this is a moment perhaps it's simply a sort of price discovery in the market. This could be a, a sign of a sort of a, a flight to, to safety in terms of capital. Um, but, you know, without sort of uh, being on the ground and, and, and sort of understanding the rationale of the individual sort of undertaking this, it's, it's difficult to sort of infer um, what, what these changes in the data might actually represent in terms of sentiment. So many are saying that the Russian elite that uh, is being hit very hard by the, by the sanction, by the Western sanctions, might use uh, crypto to circumvent those sanctions. So are we seeing any, anything that could make, believe, make us believe that that is actually happening right now? You know, in terms of total liquidity in the market, um, if you're thinking about the Russian economy as a whole, um, you know, this is not this is not sort of comparable to to uh, North Korea, for example, uh, which itself has been under significant sanctions for some time. We're talking about you know the 15th largest economy in the world, and so the l volume that would be required to actually move into um, uh, you know, move into crypto if we were to think about sort of, under, you know, undertaking the Russian economy in, in Bitcoin. We're talking about very significant volumes. And it, within crypto, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, a total sort of uh, value mar of market cap of, you know, 1.7 trillion thereabouts. Um, but, and, and, and so there's sort of not the levels of liquidity that you would need in order to be able to sort of move the, the Russian economy, if that's what you're sort of suggesting, into, into, the world of, into the world of crypto. And then the second aspect, of course, is on, you know, well, what about particular individuals looking to, to evade sanctions? And that, that's, of course, very interesting. And, you know, we have seen some uh, increase, and I think there was some reporting uh, early last week around sort of the, if, has there been an increase in the number of Bitcoin whales, for, for example? That's something we're looking at closely. So at an, at an initial glance, it, it may just be linked to uh, increases in the value of, 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 um, of Bitcoin itself, which we obviously have seen in, increase since um, since this, the invasion has been underway. Um, but you know, those are things we are going to continue to 
to watch. But I think it's important to remember, of course, although you know, current situation is, is very tragic, I think for many people that, that we are in, in this situation is perhaps you know, something that for a number of people, particularly those you know, talking about here, people with very significant amounts of, of wealth, they may have, this may be a scenario that they saw coming. So to expect to now suddenly see those movements in, in the market is, is maybe not, um, not necessarily what are the key indicators of um, you know that that sort of shifting of, of capital out of the Russian economy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, it's a bit uh, unreal unrealistic to think that uh, the whole uh, banking sector of Russia could uh, suddenly move into crypto to evade these sanctions. That sounds definitely realistic. Um, still, like talking about these very specific individuals, which have been targeted. We know that there are um, this circle of people, the so-called oligarchs, that um, are very keen in like continue transacting with the West because they have assets there, they have uh, uh, business relationship in the West and so forth. So right now the, the Western authorities, uh, US, uh, Europe, they want to keep them uh, cut out from, from the Western financial system. So are there any methods that these people could potentially use using crypto in order to uh, evade the sanctions? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I think, look, it's important to keep in mind that we're probably in a very different position as a as a sort of ecosystem than we were in say three or four years ago because you know one of the most important developments in this space over the last couple of years has been you know a very clear um, statement bringing um, you know the crypto economy within the bounds of the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism uh, framework. And what that means is that, you know, very clear obligations in terms of intermediaries in this space, in terms of collecting information uh, around their clients, identity information about those clients have been put in place and both at the government national level, uh, but also in terms of the industry actually implementing those obligations. We've obviously seen a huge amount of progress since uh, 2009 when the Financial Action Task Force uh, established that requirement for virtual assets. So the, it is true, and you know, I guess the question always comes up in this space, both um, in terms of uh, personal wallets, perhaps to start there. So, you know, well, anybody can create a wallet is the argument that often goes, and, and then, then they can shift their, their funds between their wallets. And, and certainly, you know, it is without a doubt, it's clear that, you know, those obligations in terms of record keeping don't apply uh, to private wallets, to personal wallets in, in the same way that they apply to, to third party intermediaries. The reality is, though, at the end of the day, um, it's important to be able to move those funds ultimately into into fiat currency in order to be to be spent. We're still not living in a world where one can sort of stay in the crypto economy and, and buy all the goods and services that, that one might like to, to buy. So at one point you are going to move through an intermediary who is under an obligation uh, to, to keep those identity records. The second aspect though, of course, is the question of sort of bad actors. And you know, this is true in the traditional financial space as it is in, in crypto and that's just to say you know there are bad actors who despite being under sort of legal obligations won't you know won't fulfill those obligations but I think what's interesting about crypto is that we're in quite a unique position because of the transparency and the permanency and the immutability of that public record that whether it be a case of us having the information today about who controls particular wallets, for example, um, or, uh, or that be information that, you know, comes later down the line. And there I'm talking about, for example, to date, we haven't seen any of the sanctions actually specifically reference crypto wallets, you know, Bitcoin addresses, for example, in relation to sanctioned individuals. That's something we've seen in the past um, in, in, in previous uh, sanctions efforts by OFAC, for example. It's not something we've seen as yet with the current round of, of sanctions against uh, Russian individuals and entities. Um, I thought that uh, Coinbase not long ago, just a couple of days ago, just froze 25,000 uh, addresses that were connected with like uh, Russian entities that were deemed to be committing some sort of illicit activities uh, supposedly related to those sanctions. So um, wouldn't those count as, uh, as the addresses you were, you were discussing? 
So look, I, I don't want to speak to, for, for Coinbase, but I think when I read the, the statement they put out, they certainly, rec you know, indicated that they had frozen, um, you know, these this number of accounts relating to illicit activity, but not specifically in relation to these sanctions. So what we've seen in the past, for example, is that OFAC has named a particular individual and they have a number of identifiers. They might be email addresses, but also we've seen, I think about almost a hundred instances where we've seen them actually name Bitcoin or, or other crypto uh, addresses as being related to those sanctioned entities or individuals. Now that's not uh, what we've seen so far with the current sanctions. Um, we, we know in terms of broader illicit activity and, and we've published some work on this very recently in terms of, for example, that, you know, in terms of illicit activity and revenue from ransomware, 74% of the revenue from ransomware in 2021 came from Russian related entities. So there is other types of illicit activity um, we, which might relate to the, that number of, um, you know, frozen accounts that, that you referred to. But in terms of these specific sanctions, we haven't yet seen any identified um, wallets relating to uh, the sanctioned individuals and entities. A lot of common ordinary Russians and Ukrainians uh, in this situation, they are uh, re apparently increasingly relying on crypto in order to preserve their value of their money. How do you direct the sanctions to um, the Russian that are responsible for this and uh, at the same time allowing the common Russian users f to use um, the cryptocurrency in order to um, in order to face this difficult situation. You, you do absolutely to actually be effective in, in making that kind of, you know, judgment between you know, allowing access to ordinary Russians while, um, you know, uh, preventing malicious actors to circumvent sanctions in that way. You absolutely need to combine the transparency of, of the underlying blockchain technology combined with data analytics. And that's why we've seen, you know, very much a focus both in terms of industry, but also in government in terms of, so the investigative side, that, that focus on making sure they have those capabilities um, in terms of data analytics to understand and, and, and you know, to, to investigate, to detect activity of, of the, the sort you're describing. And certainly on the industry side, to be able to identify when they may be interacting with a sanctioned entity or, or advisor. So I think that government sort of seeking to enforce sanctions and disrupt their invasion can invest in those analytics um, to kind of get ahead of efforts to to obscure sanctions evading transactions and I think you know doing so in the blockchain sort of crypto environment is much more streamlined in fact than any tools capable of, of disrupting Russia's use of a network of traditional bank wires or, or frankly even physical cash to, to evade sanctions. Mm -hmm. Yeah and uh, maybe you can give us like an, an insight in uh, what is the exact procedure that you as a, a crypto intelligence company would follow in order to identify uh, an attempt of evading sanctions by one of the sanctioned individuals or organization. So how, how would that process of, uh, of, of uh, red flagging a situation like this would work? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So basically, when we have those situations like I've described in the past, where OFAC or another sanctioning government agency has identified, you know, a particular wallet address as being related to a sanctioned entity or uh, individual, that allows us to take that information and I'm very very quickly and so within the hour and input it into our systems. And that means that if you are then a current cryptocurrency exchange who is using our products and you receive a transaction, whether that be directly or indirectly, there might be a number of stages in between, you know, the transfer to you and the, the sanctioned uh, address. You might've gone through a number of personal wallets, for example, but even so, despite it being indirect, once it hits, that person who is using our data analytics tool, they can actually, they will receive an alert that the funds being transferred to them relate to or come from, have as an origin, 
the sanctioned wallet address. And that allows them to then act accordingly. Now we know when it comes to crypto, we're not actually able to prevent the transfer of, 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 of the funds. But what we are able to do if you're a crypto exchange is not then allocate them into a particular, um, you know, to the credit of a particular uh, individual who's holding, you know, who wanted access to, to those funds. And instead it gives you that facility because it is a real time alert to actually freeze those funds to, in order to comply with your sanctions obligations. So we already provide those tools for our customers to, to sort of flag and investigate suspected sanctions evasions. But what's interesting is that we're also working at the moment on developing new, more lightweight tools to provide an easy way for decentralized protocols and platforms to conduct basic sanctions checks to help manage reputational and sanctions enforcement risks. So that's a toolkit which we're looking to expand beyond just your centralized exchanges into the world of decentralized protocols and platforms as well. So, so now well, a final question for you would be related to public policy related to, to crypto. So we know that uh, in correspondence of this uh, geopolitical crisis, there are politicians in both the US and, and Europe that are calling for taking serious measures that will prevent Russia as a state uh, to evade sanction uh, through, uh, this, through cryptocurrency. So whether this is a, um, is a justified concern or not, uh, it's a fact that uh, politicians are worried about it. So what do you think, uh, how do you think this crisis is going to change, is going to shape public policy related to cryptocurrency uh, in, the, in the next future? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, I guess there's two, two things I would highlight. And, and I guess if there's to be any sort of silver lining out of this you know, extremely sort of tragic situation that we're seeing unfold in, in Ukraine, it is that it has caused in terms of the crypto industry and, and sort of lawmakers and policy makers who are engaged in, in developing a regulatory framework for the industry, it has really forced them to come to grips at a very detailed level with how the industry actually works, how the technology works, to really clarify some of the misconceptions around, you know, well, isn't it, isn't it anonymous? Well, can't I just use my personal wallet to sort of evade the sanctions and so forth? Because it has become such a prominent political issue as well, it's really forced people to understand, well, what, you know, what is the difference? Who, who is under obligations? You know, why is it not as simple as it might appear uh, prima facie to, to actually use crypto to, to evade sanctions? So I think that, you know, that level of understanding and education, I mean, that, that education process is something we've been going through for, for a number of years. But these events have really crystallized the need for people to understand the nuances of, of the industry and also to understand how some of the features of the underlying technology can actually be extremely useful in achieving policy objectives. So that's what I would say is number one. I think the second aspect is there's no question that we will see uh, a further push to uh, on the implementation of things like the AML and CFT standard for virtual assets. As I mentioned before, this is a standard, you know, established in 2019, some further guidance in, in 2021. But both countries and the industry have been in a process of implementation. And this is not unusual. Um, you know, laws don't come out and people are able to sort of implement them on, on, on day one. So countries in their process process of actually translating that into domestic laws. Some countries have already done it, others are still in, in the works. Um, and industry itself is also in the process of working out how it will meet its obligations under those new rules. And I think what we will see at a very practical level is, is that process speed up. That was a very interesting conversation, Caroline. Thanks a lot for jumping on our show. <laughs> Thanks very much, Giovanna. It's a pleasure to be with you.